All right, here we go. Another episode of Canada on the Rocks. I am your host, Fadi Kudair. And today we are joined with one of my really good friends from probably about 15, 20 years almost. We're, we're getting old, so we're, it's, we uh, it's hard to keep old. track. We are definitely, <laughs> definitely aging ourselves here. Uh, so we have with us today Ferris Elsabag from Ottawa General Contractors, who comes highly recommended from other sources as well, too, that have been on the show, mm-hmm. and as well as, you know, the friendship that we have. So I wanted to kind of bring you on the show today, Ferris, and just to kind of tell the audience what the story is for Ottawa General Contractors. So we'll start with that first, if that's okay with you. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we started Ottawa General Contractors, you know, sometime about 15 years ago or so. You know, we were a couple of young guys right outside of university, hungry, Mm -hmm. big ambitions, really took an interest for digital marketing and sales and you know at a time where digital marketing was relatively new especially in the renovation and construction industry yeah so uh you know we dabbled in a few things and realized really quickly that we were able to uh, drum up a lot of business in renovations using the latest techniques in digital marketing and sales Mm -hmm. you know early 2009 2010 And then we quickly realized that we had something really interesting, something where we could generate the business. But it was a lot more than just generating the business. We wanted to build something that was that was cool, that was innovative. Yeah. You know, kind of modeling something like the tech companies, you know, a a good organizational culture, something that was just a little bit more different than what was out there. Now, Ottawa General Contractors is a design build company. So we mainly do renovations, but we also do like infill multifamily construction. But essentially what a design build company is, is uh, we do design in-house, so architectural design, but we also do the project management. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the management of the construction. Now, you know, sometimes they say in life you got to get lucky, you know, lucky being uh, the right timing and the right opportunity, kind of like Steve Jobs, you know, uh, grew up at a time where in in the Silicon Valley area, where it was, you know, one of the more innovative uh, tech hubs. And at a time where personal computing was just about to take off. So he kind of got lucky in that sense, right? And we got lucky in the sense that, you know, we kind of ventured off into the real world, if you will, uh, when digital marketing was new, but also off-the-shelf design technology allowed us to be a design-build company. So off-the-shelf design software, such as like Chief Architect, Mm -hmm. whereas previously to that, you would have had to go to an architect to do all the design work, and then go to like a general contractor or a renovator or a construction company to do the construction of it all. With the emergence of this kind of these kind of solutions, it allowed us to really be that design build company. I don't know if I'm explaining myself that kind of there, like uh, yeah, you know, no, no, it's, it's to, to the fair. average civilian. <laughs> exactly, like it's given us a bit of a the story, and I just want to kind of take us maybe a little bit step before that to the inception. Where did the idea come from? Why did you guys think of this? How did you come up with it? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a really good. I, that's a really good question. To be completely honest with you, like, okay, like if we're t- talking about how did we get into construction space specifically? Well, my my partner Mo Abbas, his father was uh, in the renovation industry for many years mm-hmm. uh, when we were children. Me and Mo are childhood friends since our early teens. And we were always kind of like the, you know, the ambitious of the bunch. You know, we were the dreamers. We were the ones, you know, when we were 14, 15 years old, talking about the different ideas that, that could change the world. Yeah. Different ideas of what could change our lives and how we can be pioneers and innovators in various spaces. So, you know, when we we're younger, 14, 15, we we're dreaming and thinking of the latest things. So, you know, fast forward a couple of years, we're in our early 20s. Digital marketing was kind of, um, you know, emerging. The four hour work week by Tim Ferriss was something that really inspired us. Uh, we used to get together very, very often and, and, and talk about digital marketing. And, and then, um, you know, knowing that Mo's father was in renovations, it was kind of like an outlet for us to kind of say, hey, you know what, let's see if we could generate some leads. Because, mm-hmm. you know, we, we know a little bit about renovations because Mo's father, uh, I mean, in hindsight, we realized now we knew nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's always interesting when you're like, okay, that's it. I got everything, you know, walking into the first day at the office, all of that, and then you realize you know nothing. It's it's interesting, right? Because so, you know, I consider myself at that time a sales and marketer by trade, but I wasn't necessarily a construction professional. I mean, fast forward 15 years later, I am now, but back then I was not. So often I get the question that, you know, 
did you have any hesitations? Because right off, off out the gate in our first year, we did a million dollars in business. You know, the second year we went up to three million, and mm-hmm. in the third year we did to six. And when I reflect back, it's it's I'm I, I'm surprised by my answer because I had zero hesitations. I was like, we're going to make this happen. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, uh, you go through the, the motions and, and you go through some hurdles and obstacles and then you have a lot of hesitations later on. Yeah. yeah. Um, but when we jump right into it, because moving into this role, I actually quit what many people would be consider, would consider a dream job. You know, I was, I was working for a student travel company. I was getting paid to travel the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, making pretty good money for a young kid that was, you know, living uh, in city housing, you know, making six figures in my uh, my early 20s. And uh, I had I quit a dream job to kind of pursue this bigger kind of venture that I always knew was my calling, not specifically that venture itself, but I knew that I had to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. So kind of going back on that, it's um, never had any hesitations. I knew that I had to do this, but you know, as you get punched in the face and get kicked down many times, mm-hmm. you're, you qu- you start questioning yourself. But that's the thing. Like, it, it, it's what makes the entrepreneur lifestyle really worth it is that, you know, being kicked down and getting back up and being kicked down and going back up. And every time you're learning a lesson, a new lesson about yourself, a new lesson about uh, industry, uh, and you're learning by trial by fire kind of thing. A lot of lessons learned, a lot of learning about yourself. Yeah. And uh, a lot of questioning yourself and questioning on who you want to be. Mm-hmm. You know, is this a time where we give up and we, we throw in the towel? So talk to me about a time that you thought you were going to give up. To be honest, man, there was many. You know, I'm not going to lie to you. You know, I'm it's, not one of those stories where... It's pick one of the stories. I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not one of those guys that are going to say, hey, no, I know I was never going to give up and, and I always knew it was going to work out. No, I mean, when I first came into our group, uh, Mo was starting the Ottawa location and I actually started our Vancouver location. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I left my family. I left my friends. I was working 12-hour days, six, seven days a week because not only was there a lot of work, there was a lot of learning, a lot of catching up I had to yeah. do. Uh, as a young man in my mid twenties, as a uh, you know new entrepreneur, I mean I always had some side gigs, but like this was the real test as an entrepreneur and as as somebody who's learning construction. So there's a lot of obstacles, and for me the biggest challenge we were always really good at drumming up the business. Now the operational side of things was always a nightmare, yeah. right? Like you generate millions of dollars of business, and now it's like oh now I got to fulfill this business. Yeah, and that's the thing, like for both you and Mo, you both strike me as a fantastic lead generator slash salesperson. And this is basically now you're learning the, the you know, okay, so I sold this, now how am I gonna how am I gonna actually fulfill it? How am I gonna get to it? So one thing about sales, and I've kind of realized this over the, the years we've been doing sales, is like we're always very ambitious and we end up selling the dream. And then now it's like, okay, well, we got to actually fulfill this. <laughs> we just sold, right? Like, yeah. How do we go about doing that? Yeah. Especially when we're like just learning the ropes as we go. Right, right. And you don't want to let people down. No. Right. And that was, I think, the biggest challenge for me is because like you said, yeah, we're selling this dream. My name means a lot to me. You know, I want to be a really outstanding member of this community. Mm-hmm. And now I got to uh, walk the walk. Right. And that was always the biggest challenge for me because early on, I couldn't fulfill to the level that I wanted to. Yeah. And I would say that that was a 10 year battle of just like learning how to do that, because there's many aspects of how you're going to do that. And especially as you keep growing, more obstacles and more aspects come about. Yeah. Right. So whether it's uh, recruiting and hiring the right people and whether it's building an organizational culture to retain the right people or whether it's, you know, on the sales side, setting the right expectations or whether it's building all the right relationships so that you can fulfill that dream that you talk about. Because yeah. it's one thing to say, hey, I'm going to produce all these great things, but I got a lot of partners that I'm going to rely on internally and externally to produce this. Mm-hmm. And there's a bit of a trial error internally and externally, whether it's building the right team internally from a trial error perspective, because everybody interviews really well. Yeah. Everybody's a superstar. Well, that's the thing too. Like a lot of times we do put a face on in that interview, right? right. It's like, I'm going to fake it until I make it right? Uh, in a way, but then... It's really where the real test comes is when you're on the job. Absolutely. And then and then so it's like, you know, you fast forward 15 years later, it was a lot of little things that got us to a point where we can actually fulfill in that dream that we're selling as opposed to like one or two or three really magical things. And really, you know, if you ask me, you know, I'm, I'm the most proud of, of our team. We got an amazing team of individuals who have been with us for a very long time. 
My CFO has been with us for 15 years. One of my sales guys, my general manager is 15 years. One of my other sales guys, 15 years. One of my other sales guys, 10 years. Um, a lot of guys in my operational team, uh, about you know five years. You know, just so you have an idea of how big our team is in Ottawa, we're roughly about 40 employees, and we work with about 100 subcontractors. This year, we're we're going to have somewhere in between, uh, you know, 25 and 30 million dollars of active construction. So it's a really big operation, probably one of the biggest from a design build. Uh, renovation perspective in Canada. Yeah. So and so there wasn't never really like a you know a manual to go off of. I mean there were some really good reputable companies in Ottawa that we first kind of uh, like to model. That they're pretty successful. Um, you know some companies like like Oakwood and Amstead. They've been around for you know decades. Um, really good leaders on that team. But um, but to take it to that kind of next level, we kind of had to like hamper down and be like, all right, like what does that look like? You know, and how do we do that? And like you mentioned, you know, when you look at me and Mo, we're, we're really good salespeople, lead generators. But to to get to the point that we were here today, uh, we had to become really good leaders. Yeah. And there's not really one definition of what a good leader is, right? There's many. Mm-hmm. And and it's not also just kind of like what the definition is, is. It's also what they do on a day-to-day. And there was a lot of learning. And, and that learning came by trial and error for me as well, too. Right, learning how to put certain things aside and and really make sure that everything is being done from a company first perspective. Even if that meant that I had to jump in and lead from the front, as an example, yeah, and put put my kind of like personal ambitions to the side for everybody else's. Because if you focus on everybody else's, they'll help bring you up as well too later on. Yeah. So, what's your uh, like? If we were to kind of just dig into it a little bit from sort of the inception standpoint. What's your ideal sale looked like back then? What's the ideal sort of engagement looked like? And what does it look like today? Yeah, I mean, you know, when, when we first started, you know, we were excited about any kind of sales, right? Whether it was the $50,000 one or the $500,000 one or the million dollar one. And what we didn't understand before that we understand now is that, okay, it's great to have sales, but if that sale isn't structured successfully, then it doesn't really matter, Mm -hmm. right? And what does that mean successfully? Well, the right expectations are being set. Yeah. So like I can sell to a client, you know, a million dollar job that, hey, you're going to get this beautiful custom house with with beautiful landscaping, right? But then I'm not budgeting for the landscaping and now we're in construction upset at me. And now it puts this kind of like friction point between us. That's not really a successful sale. Okay, it's great. We got a million dollars on the board, but the right expectations were not set. And early on, we didn't really understand that. More from an ignorant standpoint, we just weren't experienced enough. But today, what a, a successful sale looks like for us is, okay, big numbers are great. But we have to set the re- realistic expectations so that we continue having uh, a great relationship with our client. Um, we need to budget it accordingly so that when it transitions into operations, we don't stress our operational team out. Exactly. And, and so having the right budget, having the right scope of work, all of that kind of come together. And then hiring the subcontractor that actually is going to do the job properly. Having the right subcontractors makes a big difference for our company because if you get the professional guys in that have good quality, but most importantly are pleasant to deal with. That's the funny one in my industry. You can find a lot of plumbers that are really good at what they do. Okay, but not, and I'm just using plumbers just because that's the first thing that came off the top of my head. Not that all plumbers I mean, are like this. They're one of the main three that are very important to do any job. So 100%. But like, you know, it's like having a team that's pleasant to deal with because there's always conflicts in construction. Yeah. Okay. When conflicts arise, how are we going to handle it? It makes a big difference for my management team. So it's all these kind of little things kind of coming together for an outcome where. Um, actually, it's funny. Everything we do now revolves around three experiences. Mm-hmm. And we always ask ourselves, are we improving these three experiences? There's the client experience, there's the vendor experience, so subcontractors and suppliers, and then there's the employee experience. So everything that we do today goes to improve all these experiences and not just one or the other. Whereas maybe when we first started, we were you know, maybe focused on one and not the other because we didn't think it was that as important or we just didn't know. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and that's the thing too, because it's, it is, it's got to be a well oiled machine to keep producing, right? Like, and if you keep sort of pissing off or ticking off the, uh, 
you know, the vendors, especially the guys that are doing the subcontracts for you, especially in a market like today when it's, it's not necessarily the best when it comes to labor, mm -hmm. uh, going to be falling short. Yeah, ha having good relationships with our vendors has, has um, really taken us a long way. Uh, making sure that we're always being fair with them, making sure that uh, we pay them really fast, mm -hmm. and making sure that we just you know, reciprocate that pleasantness that I'm talking about. If they're going to be pleasant with us, we got to be pleasant back. And actually, that's some of the main feedback I get from our vendors. I'm always looking to create feedback loops and get feedback from um, whether it's our vendors, employees, or, or, or um, internal staff. And one of the main pieces of feedback I get is that our vendors love working with our staff. And to me, that's music to my ears because that means that we're cooperating, we're communicating, and um, it's it's just another check mark in the check in the box when when you know the market starts heating up like we saw in COVID. Yeah. And these contractors in those kind of in that kind of environment aren't picking up their phone. No, and then they're picky and choosy. They were picky and choosy, and choosy. And you know what? But they'll always pick up our our phone call. You know, generally speaking. Because they know, okay, yeah, it's great. The market's hot now, but there's going to come a time when it's not. And you know what? Maybe, you know, these vendors look at us like, okay, they give us like a 10, 20% discount, but they like dealing with us because they know we always pay and we're always fair and we, we pay promptly. You know, like at the end of the day, there's a lot of issues in our industries with clients paying people, you know, for whatever the reason, not saying that it's a client's issue or the con or, Generally speaking, to be honest with you, it's not really one or the other. It's just an expectations thing. And that's what we do really well, yeah, thankfully. Yeah. And expectations kind of sets the, the standard of where things are supposed to be, right? Like if I know I'm going to get paid in 30 days, I can budget for it. It's not a big deal. Right. Um, with that being said, I wanted to kind of go back, just uh, dig a little bit deeper on the client relationship. How did you guys improve that over the years? Yeah, you know, that that's an interesting one. You know, there, there was a time in about 2019 where I was really frustrated um, and I wasn't 100% happy and proud, okay? We were doing really well. We were doing eight, eight figures in um, revenue and, uh, you know, we were, we were doing pretty good. But the client experience wasn't where uh, I wanted it to be. Clients were frustrated. You know, things weren't kind of going as smooth as they should. And oftentimes I would hear from people, well, that's just the circumstances of the industry. It's just renovations. It's a headache. Mm -hmm. It's never going to be perfect. Yeah. And I almost accepted that. But I, I didn't because that still didn't make me happy even if I accepted it. So um, I really, you know, rolled up my sleeves, went to work, and I'm like, I'm going to sort out this problem. I'm going to figure out our client satisfaction rate and I'm going to improve it. Um, some of the things that were, were really good for us uh, in that time between – uh, now and then, which is, you know, almost four or five years, um, some of the things that we've done is get the right contractors on board because the right contractors, like I was saying, uh, can make a huge difference, yeah. you know, from a pleasant standpoint. From home, with homeowners, you know, they don't just want good quality. They want a good experience. And what that means is respectable people that are coming in their home, respecting their space, respecting their investment. That can mean certain things like uh, professionalism. Making sure, you know, you're taking off your shoes when you're walking in. You're not smoking in front of their house. You're not using vulgar words around their children. And you're taking the time to clearly explain things as opposed to, like, look that you're frust look at a look of frustration that they're asking you questions. Mm -hmm. Small little things like yeah, that, yeah. right? Times 10, because you got 10 contractors, like electricians, plumbing, HVAC, yeah. flooring coming in. So getting the right contractors on board. And then uh, the biggest difference was creating a feedback loop between our clients and our office in hiring a customer service manager that managed that. So our project managers get uh, reviewed every two weeks on, on five items that we identified that really matter to homeowners. Because one of my biggest friction points in 2019 was like, how do you check off all the boxes for renovations? It's like near impossible. Maybe you don't have to do that, but maybe what you have to do is focus on what that particular client really cares about and really values promptly. Yeah. Right. So as an example, you might have one uh, client profile who's never done renovations before. And even if you put, uh, you know, a, a barrier between the construction site and the rest of the house, a little bit of drywall dust kind of escapes that they might get really frustrated. But you identify that, you send somebody over there right away, clean it up, and they're super happy. 
but maybe they don't necessarily care about the schedule being super tight because they've never done renovations before. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can be a little bit lenient there. Now you might have another client who's done many renovations before, understands that a little bit of drywall dust is gonna escape, so they don't really care about that, but they want an iron tight schedule. So that's when you know you gotta focus. And it it's really comes down to like, where do you focus to really make this client happy? And promptly dealing with their concerns, no matter how big or small. Yeah. Because it could be as small as a little bit of drywall dust, but if you promptly deal with it, you win, you know, an exponential amount of bonus points with them. And that's what really is important for us. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing too, when it comes to the service industry, it's always about, uh, I call it the tripod of sales, right? Like you, you're looking at service, quality and price you're not going to get all three. Right. So you choose two right. that are making the most, imp you know, the most important to you. And then the other th third one, it doesn't have to be perfect. So for example, if price is very important for you, but maybe the service eh, could be a little iffy, but you're really good at quality. That's, that's fine. It's really up to you as a client to define which one of the three is the least important. Right. Kind of thing. Yeah, I know it's, it's, uh, it's exactly it. You know, um, I was talking with my family the other day, my in-laws, and, and we're just talking about how services dropped across the board mm -hmm. in, in all these various different industries. And I'm like, you know what? But it hasn't with us because we can't. <laughs> because that's the quickest way to develop a really bad reputation, right? 100%. And and we're in, we're definitely in the industry where you got to build on that reputation. And, you know, to kind of go back to your point about, like, that triangle of, of quality, um, and, and price and, and whatnot, it's like, yeah, look, we're definitely not the cheapest. You can go directly to the plumber and the HVAC guy and hire them directly, but- You're doing the project management. Then point. you're doing the project management and the project management, you know, is, is a big factor of these projects. They don't just get built by themselves, mm -hmm. right? Working with our company, like you get a de dedicated project manager, but that project manager has a, a project coordinator that deals with the logistics of various different items, predominantly like materials. And then there's, uh, there's somebody who, there's a service manager in case that you're really upset with, but if you're not really happy also with the project manager, they got a boss that you can escalate to. Yeah. And that guy's got a boss that you can escalate to. And generally speaking, um, it never really gets to that, to that kind of level of escalation. And we pride ourselves in communication, kind of going back to you, uh, you know, how when we first started, we wanted to build a cool company that mimicked technology companies. We really leverage technology to streamline communication with everybody. Specifically, we use Salesforce, which is like the number one CRM in the world, uh, you know, self-proclaimed. But it is really good, to be honest with you. Um, and, and we communicate really fast. It becomes very obvious in our company if you're that one team member that doesn't want to communicate. And... Um, because everybody's always waiting on information, mm -hmm. right? And then if you're not passing that information, you're slowing da them down and then potentially making them look bad in front of their colleagues yeah. or peers. Yeah. Definitely kind of like being that cog in that chain. Like yeah. You're not really gonna help the process move forward. 100%. Interesting, there's so much to learn in the construction industry. There's so much to learn specifically in the development site. I find that it's, it's actually, it's, it's the most interesting part of my real estate. You know, working in real estate is knowing about what's coming down the pipe, the, you know, the ways that you can maximize your investment as a, as a homeowner or as a landowner. Uh, and then you're always learning. You're always, always learning. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Um, it's, been, it's been a while that we were trying to do this, so I really appreciate it. And uh, say hi to your partner for me as well, too. I'll probably just send them a quick message. Uh, and I want to kind of let the folks know if, if you guys want to know more information about the Ottawa General Contractors, don't for, you know, go ahead and follow Mo. Oh, and also uh, Ferris here. Uh, make sure that if you like what you see, hit the like and subscribe button so we can get more and more episodes like this and you can learn more about businesses in Ottawa. Uh, and if you have any comments as far as a business that you would like us to kind of bring on the show, please let me know. Uh, shoot us a quick comment or send a message. I'd love to, uh, to have you on the show as well. Thanks again, Ferris. Really appreciate it, man. Thanks, Fatty. Appreciate you having me out here, man. It was Looking fun. forward to do more and more business with you as well, too. Let's do it. Appreciate it.